we got E2 up off the ground. So in this video, we're going to teach you exactly what you need to do to run an Ethereum node. And it doesn't matter if you're a total noob at this stuff. We're going to go over how to do it if you're a beginner, intermediate, or advanced at DevOps and at blockchain. Number one, everything you need to know before you start staking. You need to know what you're getting into. Second thing is how to run an Ethereum node as a tech noob intermediate and then pro and we're going to show you kind of the pros and cons of each of the different ways you can actually run one and then number three how to actually run one how to get one set up so i'm going to tell you all about the tools all of the resources you can go including my medium article which i i haven't written yet and lastly i'm going to show you what i did to get my intel not up and running and ethereum node for decentralized smart contracts it's me, me and my, my intel, intel nook Anyone and everyone should run an Ethereum node because it helps decentralize the system even more and it makes our system even stronger and even more powerful. And then you also get to gain some Ethereum, which is nice too. So let's jump into what you actually need to know. The first thing you need to know is what's going on. Ethereum is going from a proof of work network to a proof of stake network. And there's a lot of reasons why the community decided to make this switch. And one of the big reasons is that it's really, really energy inefficient to do proof of work. Pretty accurate. Instead of having a brick nailed down to the gas, we have proof of stake a part of our consensus protocol. And in addition, we also have sharding, but don't worry about that for now. It solves a massive scalability issue that Ethereum has. What happens is node operators actually put up, they stake, some Ethereum, and if they misbehave, they get slashed. And all the other nodes are watching each other to make sure they pay attention and then they do the right thing. So that's the first thing you need to keep in mind. You need 32 ETH to run a validator, 32 Ethereum, 32 ETH per validator, not 31, not 33, 32. Now you can have multiple validators. You can have them all on the same machine as well. You just need them in multiples of 32. So if you want two Ethereum nodes, you need 64 ETH. So this means that you have to lock up 32 ETH until this phase zero is over. And that is estimated to be within two years. If you're gonna be a validator, you have to lock it up for two years. So there is kind of this risk reward here. And the other thing is this is a brand new network that we're doing, right? So we've had test nets, but this is a brand new piece. Uh, so there are obviously risks associated with that as well. The two things that will let you decide if you want to do it or not are number one, can you spin up the infrastructure? And what's the ROI look like? So the ROI, return of investment or APY changes actually depending on how many validators are in the network. If there are a ton of validators, rewards are actually much lower. If there are very few validators, the rewards are very high. So it'll be up to you to decide where you think the network will actually get to. Right now, we're at about 18% or something like that. Some people have estimated that it will go down to that 5% mark at some point. Who knows? The other thing to keep in mind is there is a waiting queue if you wait too long. Right now, the queue is about two weeks. I will say, though, having the infrastructure ready to go is not going to be an issue because you're talking to yeah, boy. The other thing you have to keep in mind is that when you are offline, when your node goes down, you actually get penalized a little bit of ETH, but it's actually not very much. So an offline penalization is much different than a slashing penalization, which we'll talk in a little bit. An offline penalty, you actually will lose as much ETH as you would have gained in that time period. So that being said, if your node is up for 50% of the time that you've registered it, you should hypothetically profit if you're up 51% of the time and you don't misbehave. We'll talk about that right now, actually. Flashing, the system stays honest. If you misbehave, if you send inaccurate data, if you try to rig the system, other nodes will actually slash you. In addition to some of these early adoption risks, there's also a little bit of key management. You need to keep your private keys, not your keys, not your Ethereum. 100% write down your seed phrase and your keys. So we have the pros over here. We help decentralize the network. We make some Ethereum back and we have some considerations over here. Do we want to spin up the infrastructure? Do I want to put down the 32 ETH? Can I be trusted to hold on to my private keys? And everything that we just went over can be found on the Ethereum Launchpad website, which leads me into my next big point, where to go for information. I'm gonna tell you right now, there are four places that I think you should absolutely 100% be aware of. Number one, is this video, this channel, and my Medium article as well. I'm gonna give you all the basics. I'm running a node myself. The second place is 100% the Ethereum Launchpad, right, in the Ethereum site in general. They put a lot of work into this Launchpad, making it really, really smooth, making it really nice. You have to go through the Launchpad to actually stake your ETH anyways. 
We'll get to that in a minute. So that's the second place you need to know about. The third place that I think everyone needs to know about is this man's guides on Medium. They are so good and he has done it for every single client. So they're very, very good. They're very thorough. And then the fourth place, the Ethereum staking Discord and Reddit. I've jumped in there a lot. They want to keep making the better, keep improving and, and keep helping the network because they understand that making the community stronger is what makes this whole thing stronger. So we're going to go over beginner, intermediate, and advanced ways to run your nodes. So beginner is if you have no experience with technology, you don't, you don't even know what Linux is. Intermediate is maybe you've done a little bit of engineering. I'll explain along the way what each step is. And then advanced, you're a DevOps pro because that's all really a, a node really is, is being really good at DevOps. So if you're a total noob, the first thing that I'm going to suggest to you is use a staking pool. If, if you don't have no idea what Linux is, you don't want to be bothered with uptime. You don't want to be bothered with support. You have really shaky internet, really shaky power. Coinbase, Binance, or Stakefish. A lot of these big exchanges, they are coming out with staking pools, so it's going to be really easy soon. If you're a total noob, that is the first option, and that's going to be the easiest option. So the pros, obviously, you don't have to run your own infrastructure. There are some big cons with that, though, obviously. If there's a lot of these pooling infrastructures, that actually lowers the security of the network because it's becoming less decentralized because of that. Other con is that they will probably also eat into your profits a little bit. They'll probably take a fraction of your rewards, but you know, you're paying them for them dealing with all the infrastructure. The next easiest one is gonna get an Avado node. So an Avado node is small Intel NUC, which is a very small, like mini computer basically. And it comes pre-installed with its own operating system meant for running nodes. So this is something you, you buy it, you do have your own infrastructure that you need to keep uptime on, but it's literally kind of plug and play. You definitely still have to go through the Ethereum launchpad and I'll give you some resources and links so that you can get started there. So the Avado node is gonna be uh, the a little bit more advanced version. It comes with a steeper price tag than the individual parts, but if you don't wanna to have to worry about it, you're paying a little bit for convenience. And I, I think that that's totally great. If you don't wanna mess up, if you don't wanna mess up and you just say, hey, I don't know anything about operating systems, this is the choice for you. The big advantage here over running in a staking pool is that you're actually contributing to decentralizing the network and you get to keep more of the profits. Plus, you can show off your Intel NUC at parties or just pretend to have parties. So those are the two easiest options. One is super easy, pretty much brain dead. And then one it requires a little bit more knowledge uh, and the added responsibility of keeping your node alive and on. So the intermediate section is intermediate because you have to do a little bit of deciding. So first on the hardware or cloud implementation, are you gonna use a laptop, a server, AWS, the operating system like Dapnode or Linux, and then the software itself like the validator client. But let's learn a little bit more about how it actually works before we dive in. The first thing to know is actually an E2 node is split up into two components, the beacon chain node and then your validator node. You can actually run these on the same command. So a lot of people will use it interchangeably. When they say their ETH2 node, they're talking about this beacon chain node and your validator, which is checking the beacon chain. In addition, this ETH2 node, which again is those two components, you need a connection to the Ethereum one chain during this transition phase. The ETH1 node obviously is really, really big. And that's why you need, you know, that terabyte of SSD space. Also as ETH2 scales, you're gonna need more and more space for ETH2 as well. The ETH2 node on the other hand is really small, recommended about hundred gigabytes of storage space on it. Which brings us to the hardware specs. To run this whole thing, this ETH1 component and these two ETH2 components, you're gonna need about a terabyte of SSD, no hard disk, SSD storage and eight to 16 gigabytes of RAM. To be safe, just go with 16. So hypothetically, you could run this ETH2 part in the cloud and have it be affordable and have your ETH1 be some type of third party provider like Infura, like Alchemy. Obviously, we don't recommend this though. But if you don't wanna to have to deal with any of the hardware, this is definitely a viable strategy for you to do. So I'm gonna say that this is the easiest of the intermediates but it's also the least recommended of the intermediates. I would rather someone use an Avado node over using a cloud provider. Let's look at options. The Raspberry Pi. Don't use this. If you're super savvy, go for it. I don't recommend it. A laptop or a desktop. Yeah, you can absolutely use this. Just make sure that when it goes to sleep, it doesn't actually shut off your node. Just remember, if you're also working on that laptop or desktop, it's going to take up a lot of space and a lot of RAM. Third up, an own dedicated server. For uptime sake, this is probably the best. For energy sake, this is probably the worst. Uh, you can definitely use this as your option. Now the fourth option, and this is probably what a lot of people are gonna use, is a mini PC. Some of the most popular in the community are these Intel NUCs. You can find them for relatively cheap 
Just make sure to also buy the additional SSD and RAM and install it in. Again, I'll show you at the end of this video how to actually put those in. And then you can just leave those running in your house. I will also put some instructions in my Medium article to SSH into the box so that, you know, if you want to leave it someplace in your apartment, uh, but never actually have to go over to it, those will be in the Medium article too. So these are basically your options here. There are some links in the description on where to find and buy some of this stuff. Again, feel free to head over to the ETH Staker Discord. There's a ton of really, really helpful people there. Operating systems. Windows, Mac OS, yeah, Linux. Now we're talking. There's a reason that Linux is like the default when it comes to a lot of server technologies. Linux is fantastic. DAP node is an operating system designed for running nodes. It's really good if you're a little bit less Linux savvy, you don't have to deal with Linux and they have some great documentation on it. But if you want the full control of your instance, then I would definitely recommend Linux. But DAP node is 100% an option and something that you can use. I will also show how to install Linux on your Intel NUC. I do that at the end of this video, so stay tuned. Then when it comes to your client, I am actually not going to say anything because they are all fantastic and there's tons of tutorials on how to do all of them. And there's a reason that I say all of them are fantastic. We want to have several different clients to run our Ethereum. So when you go to the Launchpad, you'll see these four different clients to choose from. And it doesn't matter which one you pick. And it's really good that we have four different ones because if there's a bug in one of them, we still have three more that can continue, that can move on. You can definitely check out the documentation for each one of these clients. And I'm gonna show you how to put Linux on your Intel NUC so you can run it as if it's a mini Linux server. I am not in this video gonna show you line by line how to actually get it set up. Why? Because this man here has done a fantastic job of doing that for every single client. For each one of those four clients that we saw on the Ethereum Launchpad, he has the instructions on how to work with the Launchpad and use it on your Linux instance. So another reason why I'm saying use Linux is because there's a ton of support for Linux out there and you'll be able to get help really easily. Which leads me into the last segment before we go into showing the Linux install is where to get help and where to go. So I'm gonna say the first thing, obviously, this channel, when you're setting up your Linux node free to, you're going to wanna be on the Launchpad page and you're gonna to wanna to use this man's guides. Again, you can absolutely 100% use the documentation of each one of the cl specific clients. And in fact, you should reference them so you know what's going on. Uh, but he goes through a really clever way of running your Ethereum node as a service. A service is basically like a background task that constantly runs and, and can even restart if something happens. Just make sure that if you've never used services before to get a little bit familiar with the commands and how to check the status of your ETH node. You can 100% go to the, straight to the documentation of the client and get it spun up like that. But I, I, I just, I would recommend checking out his guides. They're really good and he's done them for every single validator. And if you see something that could be improved, Definitely reach out, definitely make a PR. Ethereum is an open source project and we have to keep in mind that we as a community need to make it stronger. The last thing you're gonna to wanna to do is you're gonna to wanna to set up some type of monitoring. If you're using those, these guides that I've recommended here, he actually walks through Prometheus and Grafana and shows you how to use those. I'm gonna tell you a way that's kind of the 85% way. Beacon Chain actually has an alert that says, email me if my node goes down. Again, the system is designed to be forgiving if your node goes down for a little bit. And now for advanced. So those are kind of the, the basic things that you wanna to do to have your node be up and be running. If you wanna go the extra mile and make sure you're up and running always, you know, you can do these advanced things. And that's what I'm, I'm gonna talk about now. So some of the advanced bits obviously are going to be uh, setting up a uninterruptible power supply, setting up some redundancies and having some failover. Just keep in mind, if you do this wrong, you will get slashed because if you have two validators running at the same time for the same key, you're going to get slashed. So having some redundancies, maybe setting up a, a second internet provider or a failover internet provider and some failover capacities, that's going to be more of the advanced stuff. I'm, I'm not really going to go into that now, but the other advanced thing is setting up like really robust monitoring for your box, which is going to be Prometheus. It's going to be Grafana. That's also covered in this man's guide. So check that out as well. But if you're okay with the 85% solution, then I, I think you're going to be fine. And I, I know I said I was going to show you the install at the end of this video, but we're already at like 15 minutes. So we're actually going to put it in another video. It'll be right here. It's on my channel. Go check it out. It'll be real quick. Just showing you how to put Linux onto your Intel. Network. Check it out.